get ready to study. So my wife and I, you know, often, quite often, you know, when we're getting ready, we need to make sure that the two of us are not missing any appointments. You know, like talking about doctor's appointments. I know y'all experience that, making sure I haven't forgotten an appointment, such as the doctor's appointment, maybe tomorrow morning or tomorrow afternoon, or any other kind of appointments that you may have. You know, parents experience that with children. Oh, we gotta go to their games, you know, different things that we have to do. But we have many, many different appointments, such as meetings. So my, my wife and I have many appointments that we go to, especially doctor's appointments. So me and my wife sometimes look at each other and goes, what time is that again? You know, we making sure that we hadn't missed our appointment and we don't want to arrive late either. You know, because when we get late, they'll say, I'm sorry, we'll have to reschedule. And we don't want to do that. So we're making sure, you know, to check and double check with each other, where's that doctor's appointment? Or, you know, I assumed you knew where the doctor was. And sometimes I do know where it is, and I know who the doctor's office, oh, wait a minute, let me think. Oh, so, you know, so I have to remember how to get there. You know, sometimes my wife has a hard time knowing directions and where we're going to get there. But sometimes my wife assumes that I already know where we're going. So we sit down in the car, and I think, you know, we're going to this doctor's office over here, located over here. And my wife looks at me and says, no, the names of the doctor's office, she gives it to me. Oh, wait a minute, I haven't heard of that one before. You know, and all of a sudden, time's running out. I'm like trying to look and find the address. You know, and I try to do the GPS on my phone. And then I put it up there and I drive and we get there. And then it's like, a big sigh of relief because we don't want to miss the appointment or be late. So it's very important to keep these appointments. So I'm sure you feel the same way sometimes, right? So time, sometimes we forget. We have an appointment with God. Nah. Right? It's very important that we have an appointment with Him. An appointment with God. We need to put it down and make that time with God. You sign that as an appointment, right? Everybody signs that way. Okay, the appointment with God. So what are we talking about? What do you feel that you need? It's a fellowship time with the Lord, devotion time with the Lord. There are different things that you can do in an appointment with God. You know, sometimes, you know, you need reminders to help you remember to have appointments. Jonathan says, but you need to make it a habit. Maybe it's every morning that you have prayer time and a devotion time. Some of you are very busy in the mornings. You're getting up, going to work. You know, maybe your appointment's in the afternoon or the evening. But I know one president of a seminary, he's not a morning person at all. He has to get up, you know, for important appointments and meetings, but his preference for him is in the evening before he goes to bed. To have his time with God so it doesn't have to be in the mornings it doesn't have to mean that the person has an appointment with God in the morning that you're more spiritual no not at all but some for some people the morning is more successful and for others it's in the evening it varies it's your decision but it's important that you have a habit and an appointment with God Sometimes it's best because you pray, you know, to God and you know, at night and you go to sleep. And in the morning you forget things. So, you know, in the afternoon you have a longer time to think and to meditate on that. You know what I mean? You know, you're retired and you're you know, maybe you work at the home, but you know, a lot of people are busy. Their schedules, they're getting out, you know, I have to Wait till you retire. You'll have some time. It'll be even. You know, so some people say they do it while they're driving, you know, when they talk to God and meditate on Scripture. Yeah, and that's good. You know, in the morning, doing while you're driving, you're signing, dear Tammy? I mean, how are you holding on to the wheel? <laughs> so, I don't know. I do it in the morning. So, okay. Secondly, that's true, 
You know, maybe you're not having to sign because God reads your mind. That's true. But some, you know, people sign too. Some hear people talk to themselves while they drive. So, yes, it's the same thing. Read and video. You know, sometimes I choose to do that. You know, but there's various ways. I always pray at night when I'm sitting in my chair. But if I pray a long time, I forget what I've been praying for and I fall asleep and I realize that I've fallen asleep. Yes. It's true. All of us have experienced that. But sometimes when we pray and, you know, we've gone on for a little while, then all of a sudden we realize that we're praying for the same thing again. But it doesn't really matter. So... You know, having an appointment with God. The other thing that we have to talk about is another type of appointment that we have with God. Something that we cannot avoid. We will have an appointment with God, right? Talking about repentance, you can't avoid. Prayer, each of us will have an appointment with death. Right? We're going to be going home with the Lord, and that's our appointment, right? In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it says, Once for man, for man to die, and then after that, there will be judgment. Everyone will have an appointment with death, unless Jesus comes and takes us home. That's the other appointment we may have with God. So I want to discuss the second type of appointment. It's called divine appointment. And I'm going to sign it divine. You know, divine appointment. Okay. Maybe divine means, I'm fixing to explain that, Alan. Very good. So divine means God. Something that pertains to God. Divine appointment. And that word, you don't hear it very much in the 1970s, 80s, 60s, maybe before. About the 1980s, 90s, that word started appearing more. Divine appointment. What does that mean? Sometimes, suppose, Christians... You know, right out of the blue, or something happens. Somebody calls you, or you feel a strong leading. You know, but it's a different, it's going out of your normal. You know, and you meet this one person you happen to come upon. And they're saying, so much, you blessed me. And you don't realize, you know, that they were touched with something. And something maybe have happened with them. And those people say that's in a divine appointment. That God was there. God gave you a special guidance. Something out of the norm. Sometimes it's real strange or a strange occurrence. But it happens. For example, in a story, there was a gentleman. He was a young man. He went to different houses knocking on the door. And he wanted to invite you know, them to church. So he would give them a track. You know, it would talk about salvation as he knocked on the door. <laughs> Not Jehovah Witness, but we're talking about he would hand out these tracks. And he got to this one house. When he knocked on the door, he waited, mm, waited. And then again, he decided, okay, I'm going to knock again. And then he would hear something inside. It almost sounded like a rustling, you know, so he kept trying to figure out what the noise was that he heard, and he felt very strong to knock again. And, you know, not trying to be bothersome, but he kept knocking. And then the door opened up, what do you want? You know, he gave the track, grabbed the track, and then shut the door on him. So he left, and he felt very bad that he had, like, been bothering the man. And he felt that he was a bother. So he decided to go back to that neighborhood. And he went to the doors. And again, he was trying to invite people to church. But he looked at that house and he was kind of fearful because the last time he was there, the man had 
been angry with him and slammed the door in his face. But he decided, okay, I felt the Lord, he felt the Lord leading him to go knock on the door. So he knocked on the door. And the man opened up and he was very friendly. He goes, hey, come on in. The man goes, oh, no, 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 uh uh, I just tried to invite you to church. Oh, no, 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 you must come in. And he almost felt like the man was trying to draw or drag him into the house. So the man goes, no, 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 you must come in. You must come in. Thank you for giving me that track. Thank you so much. He says, come here, I need to show you something. So he went upstairs to the attic, and you see, you know, the cord, you know, a noose. There was a noose. And the man said, that day, when the young man came to the door knocking, and he got angry, he was ready to stand up on that stool, ready to tie that noose around his neck, and to jump. That was his next step. And he heard the knocking on the door. <laughs> and wondering who in the world is that? He was afraid that maybe one of his relatives or maybe a nephew or niece had come, you know, knocking on the door. He didn't want anybody to see. You know, so he came back <coughs> down the stairs, opened the door, grabbed the track and closed the door. He wanted to hurry up to be able to commit suicide. But he knew that the stranger he closed the door, went upstairs, and at first, though, he decided to read the track. And he received salvation from him. Okay? Nope, he didn't hang himself, but he left it there to show that young man, when he came that day, this is what I was ready to do. And you gave me that track. And that young man was astonished. That's what we call a divine appointment, meaning that God, for somehow or another, has led us to some strange circumstance that we are unaware of. So that's what we mean by that. So in the Bible, do they have stories such as this? Yes. Philip, one, he was one of the apostles who followed Jesus, and Philip he felt that God had called him to preach in an area called Assyria. When he got there, he found the angel of the Lord had told him to go and took him off path. He goes, well, that thinking that was the wrong way. So I'm going to show you these verses here, and we'll talk about them, and I'm going to sign them. And we're going to go through this story slowly. So since I used the NIV, but this time I'm going to use the New King, New King James Version. And the reason why is the NKJV has verse 37 there. And many other Bible translations, like the NIV, don't have that verse 37. And I'll explain to you why. Now, the King James Version doesn't mean that the New King James Version is better. You know, people have different opinions. For me, I believe in the ES. I like the ESV. You know, it seems to me to be the most accurate. You know, following the Greek and the Hebrew translations. Um, NSB, some people feel it doesn't matter or regardless as long as, you know, the Bible has no serious um, mistranslations, many of the Bibles are good. The NIV is good. I know some people don't agree, um, but we're not going to debate the different versions of the Bible. But the New King James Version, I didn't want you to raise your hand. What about verse 37? It's not in there. So, you know, the NIV, verse 37 is not there. Anyways, so I'm using the New King James Version. So I'm going to tell you this story, okay? And you can read it for yourself or you can watch me sign. It says, Now an angel of the Lord... So who's the angel of the Lord? 
some people believe that it was Jesus, that Jesus is the angel of the Lord. You know, he's already been, he's already ascended into heaven. And in Acts chapter 8, Jesus has already left. So the angel of the Lord, some people believe that it was Jesus, spoke to Philip, saying, Hey, arise and go towards the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. It's interesting here, south. The word translated can mean midday. Like the midday sun, not meaning literally meaning going south, but go at midday. No, we're talking about arise. We're talking about you arise and get up. Get up is what arise means. It, it's not the sun rising, but it just tells the get up. So, you know, the angel of the Lord told him to go south. The word could also mean midday, like noon, meaning at the hottest time of the day. So if it's true translation, should have been midday, about noon, which would be the hottest time of the day. Now for Philip to go a different way, going to Gaza, about it being hot, you know, that's the wrong time to travel. But he obeyed, and maybe sometimes in our lives, we find ourselves, you know, leading us a different way, and you're thinking, oh, no, this doesn't feel right. This doesn't, you know, the weather's bad, or maybe for some reason, you know, it's just out of your norm, and you're thinking, I shouldn't be going. But Philip, he obeyed. Don't know what to do, what he was going to be doing there, because he had not been told. But he went ahead and took a step and started to travel to Gaza. And it said, this is desert. It's barren. Okay, so he went ahead and went ahead and traveled. So he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, it's from Egypt, he was from Ethiopia. He lived in this desert. He saw this person, just one. It wasn't like he expected a whole flock of people there. Just one, though. And he was a eunuch. Meaning what? It means that the person... Not enough. No, that's not what the translation of eunuch is. So that means that this person, his private parts, his testicles had been removed. He'd been castrated. So the reason for the castration was so that he could not be distracted by thoughts of women or sexual temptations. So that was the point of castration. So like dogs, you know, we castrate dogs, you know, so they don't want to go chasing after dogs in heat, female dogs in heat. So this gentleman, he himself, his responsibility, oh, I'm sorry, let me back up. This eunuch, people, talking in general, the Jewish people would not think of him as the ability to become a Christian. Do you know why? Because of Jewish law long ago under Moses explained it says in Deuteronomy, it says no one who has who's already been castrated or emasculated by crushing, you know, crushing, it happened like maybe as something, an accident happened, that something happened. Crushing or cutting. So it's talking about castration. No one who had that done may enter into the assembly of the Lord. 
So it says by Jewish law they were not permitted. No, it means that no one, it's their wording is different, but it means it's not possible. Is it possible that I can go to the restroom? You cannot. It doesn't mean that no. It's just straight out saying that you may not. So the person who had been castrated, even if it was from an accident or purposely done, they could not enter into the assembly of God. So it was not allowed. Because God had emphasized the importance of being in perfection to be able to enter into his presence. That's Old Testament. Under the Old Covenant, it was a picture of perfection. So under the New Covenant, is that true? No, it's not. Jesus is the one who provided perfection. He was our high priest. He entered in, and so it is open to us to enter into God's presence. It's not like it was in the Old Testament of the people of Israel when they couldn't enter into the tabernacle. They couldn't. But does this mean that the one who's castrated cannot go in, you know, to a group of people in general? No, it doesn't mean that. It just means that those rulers or those in service for priests, talking about the general people coming together, those people of Israel, you know, listening to God's word and worshiping, yes, they were those who were castrated were able to join that, but they could not be involved in those who had responsibilities for priesthood or priest work. You know, that was a bit elevated. God had only given that to a select few people. So a eunuch allowed to go into the temple or tabernacle? No. Those others who had, you know, maybe been dismembered, sick, maybe women who had won their periods. So it says no descendant of Aaron, the priest, who has any defects, means something wrong, maybe being deafness, blindness, having your hand cut off, is to come near to the presence of the food offerings to the Lord. For he has a defect, he must not come near to offer the food of his God. Okay, so that shows that God was very strict because he was holy. God is holy, and he would expect the same. Had to be perfect, no blemish, nothing dirty, no sickness. That was talking about the point of pointing prophecy towards Jesus, that Jesus himself was perfection. So this is, we're talking about the eunuch. You know, had a, his responsibility was in business. So he was a great authority. You know, that he, sorry, <laughs> my nose is running. Okay, so this eunuch, he had responsibility, a great responsibility, you know, that's the reason why he had to be castrated, because he needed to be able to focus in only under the queen. Her name was Candace. <coughs> the queen of the Ethiopians. <clears throat> the man, the eunuch, had charge of all her treasury, which meant her money, you know, like he was in charge of the bank. And he had come to Jerusalem for the Jewish people were coming to celebrate, and he was coming, which it appeared, there were a few of those who lived in Egypt who had heard of the gospel and they were learning Hebrew and their customs like circumcision and all these different things at that time that's history but they were not 
following it 100% Jewish customs. You know, they just had heard about Jesus, wanting to know about him, you know, but they didn't know very much. But this gentleman, he wanted, his heart's desire was to know about Jesus, so he decided to go to Jerusalem and join in with the Jewish celebration. And then he was on his way back home. And he was sitting in his chariot. And he was reading Isaiah the prophet. And then the spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake, which means join in, his chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. You know, he just happened to be there at the right time. The man was reading a scroll, and he was reading through it, and the perfection was the time of the gospel where he was reading. And Philip heard what he was saying. So it was very obvious that the angels of the Lord who had told him to go was trying to do things for right timing. So it's not just by chance, you know, like one in a million kind of thing, chance, but it happened. That's what we talk about as a divine appointment. <coughs> so, the eunuch was reading this scripture. So we're going back to the Old Testament. It is in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7 and 8. He said, he, talking about Jesus, was oppressed and afflicted. He was beaten. Yet, he did not open his mouth. He himself was led like a lamb to the place where he would be slaughtered. So who is the lamb? We're talking about Jesus, yes. This prophecy is about Jesus. Remember we're talking about Jesus carrying his cross? And then he was crucified. That's what we're talking about. This is the prophecy from Isaiah from long ago. And like a sheep before it shears, meaning the person who cuts off all the hair, you know, talking about the wool, the removal of the wool from the sheep, he still did not open his mouth. So by oppression and judgment, the sheep was taken away. Meaning that he was already under judgment and he was shunned, even though it was unfair. And it's truly, it happened. You remember Jesus was taken before a mock trial and they had false witnesses who talked against Jesus. But Jesus was completely innocent, but they had already decided that he was guilty. <clears throat> Yet who of his generation protested? Meaning, Jesus had no children. The names were gone. Never heard from him because, you know, he had no generations to pass long stories about him. There was nothing that came of him. So, like, if you, you know... If you're a father, you have children, you know, you tell them stories, they pass it on to the next generation. Oh, yeah, I remember from long ago, my grandfather used to tell this story. But no, it doesn't mean that Jesus was married to have children, no. It just meant to show that there was shame on him. He had not a good name to pass on. What was left going on after he died, there would be nothing like a criminal on the cross. You know, that was a lot of shame. You know, death was good riddance. No one would remember them anymore. So that's what it means here. 
For he was cut off from the land of the living. And sure enough, Jesus, when he was brought, he was taken out of Jerusalem. And that's where he was crucified, out of, outside of Jerusalem. Reason for his transgressions, the breaking of the law of my people, and God saw, he said, broke the law of my people, talking about Christians who trust in Jesus, we broke the law. And the reason, and that's the reason why Jesus was punished. And that's the gospel, right? <coughs> so Philip heard this eunuch reading the scripture and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And the eunuch said, How can I? Unless someone guides me or explains it to me what it means to help me understand and he asked Philip to come up and sit with him and the place in scripture which he read was this he was led as a sheep to slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent so he opened not his mouth remember we just read from Isaiah that same thing that was the scripture that the eunuch was reading and in his humiliation humiliation his judgment was taken away there was not a fair judgment and who will declare his generation talking about who would pass along his legacy. There would be none. You know, Isaiah said the same thing. For his life is taken from the earth. He's gone. We'll never hear about him again. His name has disappeared. For example, if Tommy had a son and Tommy passed away and he had no sons, I don't know who you're talking about. I don't know who Tommy is. You know, for here, we discuss who's Tommy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that bad man. Who, you know. Not that Tommy's a bad man, but, you know, I'm just giving an example. His name's gone. Nobody really remembers. You know, years later, oh, yeah, I forgot about him. You know, that's kind of like what we talk about because his name's gone. Nobody talks about him anymore or nobody to pass it along. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does this prophet say this, of himself or some other man? Who is he talking about? Then Philip opened his mouth and began, and beginning at this scripture, meaning he preached or taught Jesus to him. So what did he preach? Maybe Philip looked at the Isaiah in the scriptures before this section. And in verse 6, you know, these are just the verse before it. It says, we are all like sheep and we've gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him, talking about Jesus, the iniquities of us all. Of all of our sins were laid on him. That was the prophecy. Sin is what um, iniquities means. And then verses 4 and 5 before that says, Surely, talking about Jesus again, he took up our pain and bore, accepted our sufferings. Yet we considered him punished by God that God was punishing him because he was bad. Remember a long time ago, people looked at Jesus and his crucifixion. You know, the Jewish people looked at him as a bad man. You remember? Just like, you know, he was bad and God was punishing him. But no, this was God's plan for Jesus to die on the cross for us. Thinking that he was punished by God, stricken by him, 
and afflicted. But he, talking about Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions, meaning our broken laws. He was crushed, meaning beaten terrible for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace, which meant our relationship back to God, right? right? This is the gospel here, so praise God was on him, and his wounds we are healed. We're talking about our spiritual healing, that our sins and our filth has been healed and removed. So this is the gospel. So Philip had a wonderful opportunity to preach to this one person. There was nobody else out there. It was a desert. You know, at the special time to pay attention to one person, that's really strange, right? And a eunuch of that, right? So he didn't, just telling him the gospel. So we feel like, you know, this is really a right person to tell him the gospel. Maybe, for example, he himself, I don't know anything here, that he's drunk. took the wrong path, or maybe he's involved in gangs, you know, piercings, or tattoos, you know, piercings. <laughs> you know, I've seen, you know, where we have lots of piercings, and they have those big holes in their ears, you know, all this type of stuff being done, but their clothing is so different, you know, tattoos, different things all across their bodies. But just imagine, as we look at him, it just doesn't seem like he would be a person that you would want to share the gospel with. You know, is that my decision, though? No. I go ahead and give him the gospel. You never know what that, how God will use that person later and understand salvation and change. You never know. So many Christians... You know, who are motivated to become preachers and missionaries, you know, before had been themselves were bad. Maybe some of them had been in prison, you know, many of them. So this eunuch, why would God tell Philip to go and talk to this eunuch? All we can explain was a divine appointment. <coughs> so Philip preached to him. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water. And it just happened that water be there. You know, water is not always there. Sometimes it becomes so dry in the desert that there is no water. But at the right time, there happened to be water there. God told Philip to go. You know, just like he said, in the midday, in the heat of the day, what do you want me to go for to this strange man? But he went preached and then there happens to be water so the eunuch said see here is water so what hinders me or prevents me from being baptized then Philip said if you believe and with all your heart you may meaning that you have to believe receive Jesus for salvation, and then sure, you can go ahead and be baptized. So this is in italics here, um, when Philip, meaning many of the old manuscripts, they don't find this verse in here, 37. Why? Because they didn't use, if you look at your Bibles, maybe some of you, there's no verse 37 in here that looks like that because it's not found in the reference of the manuscripts. In the King, New, in the King James Version, in the New King James Version, it has it, and the ESB, NSB have, but, you know, explains that verse 37 is not in the manuscript. Some of it had been eliminated, but it doesn't mean that this version is bad. It just so happened, but it regardless, it says, if you believe with all your heart, you may be baptized. So, and he answered, 
and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, meaning he was saved. Then, go ahead. We could be water baptized at that point. So that is a phenomenal opportunity to see a person saved right there. You know, I remember some of my experiences in the past when I've explained the gospel to the person and their lives have been transformed from that point on. It's really wonderful to see that person, as we call it, being born again. And some of you have experienced that yourself. And Philip felt inspired. You know, it seemed to come at the wrong time of the day, at the wrong place, the wrong person, but it was a divine appointment that God had already had planned out for people to become saved, which it didn't seem like it was the right person. But it didn't matter. The gospel touches all. <coughs> So the eunuch, he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, and he was gone, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing meaning he was saved so well, I'm telling you here that history going forward what happened to this unit it doesn't say anything about it until the second 101 the first century after the first century a man a church father meaning a person who led Christians, and they call him a church father, <coughs> wrote, his name was Irenaeus. He wrote against heresies, and he told a story about this eunuch. He had heard Philip talk the gospel and was saved, you know, out in the desert, that man, he became a missionary when he came back to Ethiopia, and he spread the gospel, and there were many, many, many saved through him. But he was the only one had heard, and nothing in the Bible had been talked about him again until this time when this gentleman wrote about him. You know? You know, it's strange that God would put one person, but God used that one person to spread the gospel by Philip telling him and then it went on like wildfire from there. You never know. God may call you to become a missionary, a pastor, however old you are. You will never know what God's plan is for you. Even though it may be a strange feeling or maybe somebody tells you, you know, that you need to become a pastor and you're like looking at me though. <laughs> for example, let me look at what time. Time is gone by fast. It's 1030. Okay. Wow. I'm going to have to jump ahead here. Okay. So remember, the scripture is sufficient. It explains many doctrines from Genesis to Revelation all the way through the Bible. It does not mean that the Bible is sufficient for God to lead them. You know, when we focus in on the Bible, it is important that we look at the Bible, yes, but this special guidance is almost like a divine appointment, you know. Pay attention and go obey. Both of these come together. You cannot follow the spiritual guidance or divine appointment without knowing Scripture. You have to know scripture. And then when you follow God's leading, wherever it may be, a strange place, strange time, strange person, whatever that leading is, you must know scripture so that you can go and tell them the right way. Because if you don't know scripture or the wrong teaching, you know, when you start to follow, then you get off track and you go the wrong way or you distract 
or you emphasize something that the Bible is not teaching. So you have to have both of these. You need to know the Bible, yes, but you need to hear God's guidance. They have to fit together. And some people in other churches emphasize experience. No, that does not supersede scripture. Your supernatural experience or something that God has given you, wow, but be careful and make sure you're looking at what scripture says. If it doesn't match, you need to step away and don't accept that. So I'm giving you an example, like bird. Suppose a bird, maybe let's just say a dove, like a Holy Spirit, you know, that's the example of the Holy Spirit is a dove. And it flies and you're driving, right? And you're following this dove. You know, you're just watching the dove, going where the dove goes. If it veers right, you veer right. Because you're following this path, right? And you're following the dove. And you keep following. And you, every time it changes, you change. And when you're driving that dove, you know, you realize you can't take that turn to that right because there's no road. Now you're off-roading, you know, going through water or, you know, maybe you'll hit a tree. But that dove is flying and you're watching, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna ignore it? Because that is not, God is not giving you a sign. He's not leading you there. You ignore it because you're following the road. There's no road there. So you keep going straight and you ignore it. It's the same idea if someone tells you a story explaining, well, this is what God told me you know, and you're sitting there, really? And then, you know, they're going off track and it doesn't fit scripture. You ignore it, just like you did the dove who went off the road. So it tells, the Holy Spirit told me to tell you this. You need to resist because it doesn't match scripture. If it doesn't match, you don't listen. You ignore. Understand? So these both have to come together. You have to have an understanding of scripture and special guidance. We see where God guides you. If it fits with scripture, then that's fine. Okay, we'll have to hold off on more explanation. So hopefully we've learned something today. <coughs> Divine appointment is very rare. It's not an everyday occurrence. It just all of a sudden may hit you one time in 10 years or maybe one time in a year. It's very rare. But keep in your mind, it is very rare that it's not an everyday occurrence. Okay? Father, we are so grateful for your word. Thank you for the scriptures that shows that you are perfect and you can use anything in nature, any animal, people, to lead us in a special way. Maybe to a strange circumstance, a strange person, or a stranger. Help us not to be resistant. Help us to open and follow. You're the supreme ruler and sovereign, and we know that we make mistakes but your grace is sufficient for us. So help us to grow in the Lord more and be more sensitive to the Holy Spirit and the guidance that he gets. In Jesus' name, amen.